It's the call up and we have another farm system rundown on this Monday. It is the Cincinnati Reds that we are updating. Jack McMullen has his red hoodie on, which you told me was by chance. It wasn't even really because we're doing the Cincinnati Reds. It's because it was sitting on the couch this morning. Yes. uh, So it's actually salmon. If you saw it in person, it would be a salmon hoodie, but the lighting is kind of doing it dirty and it looks red, but you know what? It's red. You're not, you're you're not like a color snob. Are you like, Oh, that's not red. That's salmon. Or that's not purple. That's magenta. Well, I, I just did it, but (laughs) typically no. Okay, good. Also, I hate when colors are named after like animals and things and whatever that's not a color like that's a it has a different purpose in this world so how do you decipher between blues like when when you say baby blue carolina blue orphan blue sky blue do you do that or do you just say that one's a little bit lighter than that orphan orphan blue yeah the saddest of all blues is that why they call it orphan blue is that why they call it orphan blue yeah Jeez. Yes. Jeez. Yeah. Let's 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 talk about brighter futures. Uh, let's talk about the Cincinnati Reds farm system uh, because they've got. Also, by the way, they just name it. Is there more of a backstory on the Reds? Like, are they, is it just the Reds color, or is there like uh, you would know this more than I would? What's the history of the Reds name? I don't know. I I know they were one of the first teams in baseball. Like maybe they were the Red Stockings before. Uh, were they were the yet. Cincinnati Reds the first? red like the first baseball team I do. again we're, we're talking about the future so uh, yeah, I, I like I wrc plus need to, <laughs> yeah. yeah i know I, I don't know history but i could tell you uh this guy's wrc plus but we're going to talk a lot about wrc plus we're going to talk a lot about pitchers though because this system already had one of the most exciting uh i would say pitching prospect duos in baseball we talked about that with lodolo and hunter green and now they added a few of the more exciting pitching prospects, I think, that could have possibly been attained in the trade market, right? Of course, you could go say in Grayson Rodriguez is one of the most exciting pitching prospects in baseball. I think the most. That's not an attainable prospect. I would argue that Brandon Williamson and Chase Petty are two of the more exciting prospects that were remotely attainable during this offseason. And the Reds got both of them. Obviously, they had to dismantle a little bit to do that. Uh, but I'm excited to talk about this system, Jack, because this is one that we wrote up uh, a while back. And now updated with those new acquisitions. Where does Brandon Williamson slide in? Where does Chase Petty slide in? And and how does the rest of this system shake out? Very excited about that. Uh, We're probably not going to spend a million hours at the beginning on Lodolo versus Green because we're going to talk about it at the end as part of our trading card segment of who would you invest in based on the prices because Lodolo and Green, these are guys that are always going to be considered neck and neck if you ask almost everybody on the planet. And right now, I think that it's Lodolo kind of getting the leg up, especially now that he looks healthy, right? There was health concerns. And that's our number one prospect in this red system is Nick Lodolo. And he looked really good already in spring training. I mean, really darn good. And as long as he's healthy, that's really the only issue is health. He is, I think the world is his oyster. It's really just amazing to watch this guy pitch. It's a plus fastball. It's a plus slider. It's an above average, potentially plus changeup. And guess what, Jack? It's plus command too. Yeah, I. You look at pitchability, and the pitchability difference between Lodolo and Green is just through the roof right now. Obviously, Green has the way better fastball, and you could make the argument that Green has the better slider too. But Lodolo's slider not far off. The fastball has different types of life compared to green. So while green is 103 in a straight line, it's impossible to hit 103, but Lodolo is mid nineties that dives. Like it's mid nineties that runs. Lodolo is a very fun pitch mix guy. And his pitch mix is a lot more exciting than green. I love Lodolo's swing and miss capabilities. This guy can get tons of swings and misses. And I want to point to how he absolutely obliterated left-handed hitting. He started 10 games with double H Chattanooga last year before getting the call up to Louisville. I think he started three games with Louisville at the triple A level, but in double A 10 starts, he faced 50 left-handed bats. Those 50 left-handed hitters hit 180, 
with a 180 slugging. That's a 406 OPS in lefty lefty matchups in double A. No shot. You just have no shot. <laughs> it's 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 hilarious. If you put that on ball, it's a seeing eye single. Yeah. And, and here's the amazing part is, and this is why you, you talk about how Hunter Green's fastball has more upside. Right now, if if I was like, I need five good innings. And I need somebody to, to give me a quality start or six innings, I guess, is technically the quality start. They should change that to five with the way the game is now, by the way. Absolutely. That's a separate conversation. That's a just baseball show conversation. Uh, I really think that I would be taking Nick Lodolo because here's the thing is even when he's not on with his secondaries, and this is something you see with you know some of the exciting pitchers that can get ground balls but also get the swings and misses. Okay, my secondaries aren't on today. Well, I'll just use my turbo sinker, my heavy fastball in the 92 to 96 range and just get ground balls. And usually those guys will survive. They'll pitch to contact and they'll survive. I see it with Sandy Alcantara all the time when I was covering the Marlins, especially early on when he wasn't as good with the secondaries. It was, let me go to this heavy fastball that's hard at the bottom of the zone and these guys will roll over. And I think that's definitely something that gives Lodolo the much higher floor. But here's the thing is we've seen him run that thing up to 96 touch a 97 uh the the change up keeps getting better and what's most amazing about that fastball though the reason why i would take it right now over over hunter greens is that and we'll get into green and some of my hesitations with him and and hesitations might be a strong word because i think he's phenomenal lodolo commands the hell out of it and you see guys with that much action on their fastball struggle to command it oh it misses back over the middle oh it's missing diving inside oh i'm running it in and hitting batters None of that happens with Odolo. He commands it on both sides of the plate, he commands it at the bottom of the zone. He can even elevate it sometimes and, and have it be a little bit straighter. With that off of his slider and the changeup, I mean, it, it's, it's really, I would be shocked if this guy's not a three at the worst. At the worst. A, a three-pitch mix is beautiful from a prospect. You don't see it that often now. Usually you have the electrifying one-two, fastball slider. Typically it's hard and harder. With Lodolo, he's got hard, harder, and then he's got the equalizer in the changeup, and he's got the ability to locate it. You're right. And I want to go back to your ground ball point because his ground ball rate in Chattanooga and Louisville, again, smaller sample size, well over 50% in terms of ground ball rate. I'm looking at fan graphs right now, 54% in Chattanooga, 56% in Louisville. That's phenomenal. Yeah. If you can just hammer belt and below, belt to knees, and get swings and misses at the rate that he does, a 36% K rate and a 6% walk rate, dude. And and keep in mind, where are these guys pitching? You know, this is this is the big thing for me is is Hunter Green is susceptible to the long ball and he's pitching in Great American Ballpark. Nick Lodolo gets ground balls two thirds of the time when it's in play. Strikes guys out vast majority of the time. Like it, it's, it's insane. So you're either getting ground balls, strikeouts, and you're not walking dudes. So, I mean, to beat Lodolo, you either have to string together three hits or get lucky and catch one mistake. Like he doesn't give up a lot of home runs and that's going to translate into great American ballpark because he, he's a ground ball guy that also gets swings and misses. That's like the dream. The other guy that is a ground ball guy that gets swings and misses is Luis Castillo. And I know that yeah. he's a little bit of a roller coaster, but I mean, at the end of the day, he's been one of the best pitchers they've had in a long time because he's a ground ball pitcher that gets swings and misses. Lodolo is the prototype for this Reds team. Uh, and, and I think they, they are planning for him to be their guy. And I know you can talk about the injury concern about Hunter Green has his own injury concern as well. So yeah. I think when you're comparing these guys neck and neck, uh, Lodolo is as long as he's healthy is, is the guy above for me. And uh, the arsenal we were talking about, and I have it in the write up, which is linked in the description of the podcast, Taylor Rogers and him and Nick Lodolo have very similar movement profiles to their stuff. And Taylor Rogers is a nasty reliever. Lodolo is a starter. Uh, it, it's just to me, so exciting. And to, I think he's probably one of the most exciting pitching prospects in baseball. Uh, we're going to see that up close and personal. I think he's going to get some opportunities to pitch at the big league level, at least at the midway point of this year. Quickly. I think, I think quickly, I think green gets there first. I think Lodolo is not far behind because Lodolo is going to start probably five or six games in Louisville this year. And they're going to look at him and they're going to say, you know what? Like we're good. We've seen yeah. what we need to see. Get up here, help us out because we just traded away Sonny Gray. Yep. 
Yep. We just traded away Sonny Gray and the fans are upset and we need be a reason for people to come to the ballpark. And uh, I'm not saying that Nick Lodolo is going to sell out GAPB, but uh, our GA, how do you say BP? GAB. Yeah, I, I usually just call it Gab. Gab. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I don't, is that what they say on the broadcasters, uh, in the broadcasters world? No, usually you get low and you bellow out great American ballpark. Oh yeah. That was good. That was good. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that's what I really see. I don't think fans are going to be lining up there, but they're going to want some, some just injection of excitement into this team. And I think Odolo is going to provide that he's the number one prospect for us. Uh, and, and again, not an indictment on green. It's just how darn good Lodolo is. Real quick before we move on, here were the numbers for Lodolo last season in 50 and two thirds innings between double A AA and triple A 2.31 ERA, 2.09 FIP, 0.97 WHIP, 39% K rate, 5.5% walk rate. I mean, that's just absolutely comical. Uh, if we would have got a full season out of him, it would have been ridiculous. If for those who might not know, it was shoulder fatigue. That cut yep. the season short. So it wasn't a, a in, an injury that needed a procedure. It wasn't an injury that required extensive, extensive rehab. It seemed like a more precautionary move as far as we know. Okay, so here's what I want you to do. As we transition to Hunter Green, I want you to keep those Lodolo numbers that you just mentioned right in front of you, and I'm going to walk you through Green's numbers. Cool? Okay. Let's do it. Give me Lodolo ZRA. Lodolo, and, and, and albeit it's in less innings, it's in the 50 innings, but 2.31 ERA. 2.31 ERA, Hunter Green, 4.13 ERA in AAA, 198 in AA across seven starts, mm-hmm. but he threw the majority of his innings in AAA, so that equates to about 3.5. Now give me the FIP for Lodolo. 2.09. 2.09, okay, 4.46 in AAA, 2.35 in AA for Green. Give me the WHIP for Lodolo. 097. Okay. 129 for green, 100 at double A, 129 in AAA. Give me the strikeout rate for Lodolo. 39%. Okay. 37% in double A, 29% in AAA for green. And then give me the walk rate for Lodolo. 5.5. 5.5. 8.6 for green in double A, 9.1 in AAA. So walking through all the notable numbers for a pitching prospect, Lodolo is better in every category. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and I'm glad you mentioned the double and triple A because I mean, Hunter Green was lights out in double A um, and, you know, struggled a little bit more in triple A. Lodolo had a cup of coffee in triple A before he got shut down and struggled, but the struggles were because he got, like he got shut down because he was Velo was down in those couple outings. And they said, no, let's not, let's not mess with this anymore. Let's, let's make sure he's good. I mean, th- here's the thing. What's the difference between double and triple A in terms of what they use as a, rock out there uh to play baseball it's it's a big league ball yeah they use the big league ball and what is hunter green's mo- most susceptible aspect of his game it's the long ball yeah so it's not a coincidence that hunter green struggled in triple a i'm glad he went to triple a last year and and saw how he could be susceptible to the long ball when it's a big league baseball because it's still even with the dead end quote unquote baseball ask any minor leaguer they're telling you, bro, you, you take BP with that big league baseball. It is totally different than the minor league balls. It really is. Um, on top of that, these are more experienced hitters. You know, I went through and I watched every home run that Hunter Green went, uh, gave up. I watched multiple starts uh, on the positive end, too. A lot of the home runs that Hunter Green gave up were to quadruple A guys. You know, experienced uh, guys that were in the big leagues for five, six years, now trying to get back. Uh, I could give you some names and you'd be like, oh, my gosh. Uh, but my point being. Hunter Green, and I said this in the write-up, he was a guy that, that was pretty easy to game plan for if you're a vet. As easy as it could be for a guy that's throwing 102, right? The fastball it has the potential to be plus-plus, and the slider is a plus pitch. There's no doubting that, but we haven't seen him throw the changeup. And here's the thing with Green is if you know that there's almost a sure thing that you're going to get a fastball or a slider, you're going to guess fastball and just die on that hill, right? I'm going to be sitting 102 elevated, die on that hill. If he locates three sliders, I will tip my cap and I will walk back to the dugout. Hunter Green's not locating three straight sliders for a strike. If he does it, not right now, not right now. But do you want him even doing that? Right? Like we're not trying to make him Lance McCullers. He's not Max Meyer even like he's better than that. 
And, and I, here's the thing, the fastball, the profile is a bit flat and you have hitters. Now, if you're trying to hit him, you're keying in on the fastball, which he throws 60% of the time, you have a two out of three chance to be correct that he's throwing the fastball. And if you catch it, it's gone. If you catch it, it's gone. And that's why 11 of the 14 home runs, I believe that he gave up were on the heater. They were all on the heater because guys were just cheating for that. And once they got it, they played the percentages and, and it, that was how he got burned. He needs a third pitch. It doesn't need to be great, but he needs a third pitch or else uh, he's always going to be a guy that gives up a lot of home runs. And that's going to hurt a lot in the big leagues and in great American ballpark. 21 outings. He went six plus innings, one, two, three, four, five, six times. So he can go starter innings. Like you may hate me for saying this. Reds fans may hate me for saying this, but I think Hunter Green is the best Swiss Army knife ever created. I think he is better than Kopech. He's better than, you know, any of these like guys that can come on and throw three innings of relief. I think Hunter Green is best used one time through the order or two times through the order. I don't think he's a third time through guy right now. Well, when then he why debuts, not develop him to be? Yeah, you can develop him to be, but here's the thing. Hunter Green is already 22 years old. I would like him, granted that is, you know, a below average age for, you know, a, a prospect that's going to make their debut. Usually they come up when they're 24 years old, but I, I like the idea of Green breaking through with the Reds this year as the best swing man in baseball with 103 and everybody sees it for the first time and they're flustered and you continue this process at the big league level a la Kopech, Right. Kopech. How is that working for Kopech right now? I don't know. We have yet to see. I, I, I don't know if I want to see that delayed timeline because, and I, I like the idea, but I, if I was in charge here, I would approach it differently because here's my argument before last season, Hunter Green hadn't thrown since 2018, Jack. And, and in 2018, it was, it was 68 innings in low A. Yeah, so yeah. it had been almost three years, right? And this was our first, this was his first full season. I, I don't care what anybody says. This was his first full season. It was his first time throwing more than 68 innings. I mean, 2017. He only threw 106. He only threw 106 innings. Yeah, he threw 106. It was his first time throwing more than 68 innings in, in, in a season. I really want to see him, like, develop as a starter. You talk about him being 22 years old. In terms of his baseball age, he's an infant. I mean, he's only thrown in his professional career now 179 innings. That's not even a season and a half, really. I would love to see him just make 12 starts or so in AAA and just hammer that change up. Just continue to try to develop that third pitch. I think if you bring him up to the big leagues, you get into like fight or flight mode and it's how do I get guys out? Let's stick with what works. 102 and sliders. He's going to get right back to where he was in AAA last year. He'll be effective. He'll give up a bunch of bombs. He'll have blow up outings. He'll have good outings and you won't be able to stretch him out. I, I kind of want to see him get more and more starts under his belt in AAA and develop as a starter. Because at the end of the day, this guy's only made 42 starts. And three of those were one inning starts in rookie ball. So he's really only made 39 starts. Yeah. I think you're working, you know, I, I think that our thinking might be a bit backwards to what the Reds have been thinking traditionally, where green is going to beat Lodolo to the bigs. I think Lodolo should beat green to the bigs. Are the Reds going to do that? I don't know. Green has already logged way more starts at AAA than Lodolo has, but like, I just think Lodolo is more big league ready than Hunter Green is right now. And the question is, do you want the, um, you know, you, you see a lot of these high velocity righties come up uh, and make their debut a bit premature. That was not the case with Shane Boz, but if you look a couple of years ago to Dylan Cease, he made his debut prematurely because he was nibbling and he was walking everybody and he was only getting through three in the third innings. I'm worried that's what Green is going to do. He's going to nibble. He's going to exactly. walk a lot of guys confidence is going to get low and he might have to pull a Kelnick or, you know, farther back a Julio Arias and go back down to triple a, get the confidence back and come up and be great. I would prefer if he was just great from the jump. Well, I think everybody would prefer that. Right. <laughs> and, and so I, I get that. So you're saying the best, the best way to do that is by putting him in, in short outings to succeed. I think the best way to do that is to run him out in triple a and let him just keep working through it. Uh, I could see both being an option. Again, 
Someone that will bring Reds fans to the park is Hunter Green. And I'm not saying you, you base your decisions on that, but the Reds could feel confident about their big league staff and say, we develop him up here. I mean, we saw the Tigers try that with Matt Manning. We saw the Tigers successfully do it with, with Tarek Skubal, who, by the way, his curveball looks phenomenal. I think Skubal looks gonna, great. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very, very excited about Tarek Skubal. And, and I'll, I'll tell you, like, that was a guy that I was, you know, excited about, saw him in the big leagues, not excited about, faded to oblivion. Um, but you know, you could still see what was there. And now I think we're seeing him develop as a pitcher again. If the Reds have that kind of confidence in their big league staff, then yeah, you know, maybe put him in positions to succeed short starts, uh, and go from there. I think that that's the way it should go, but like, let's, let's make 10 starts in triple a first and just hammer that change up. He threw it 5% of the time last year. Like I yeah. want to see him throw it because here's the thing. And let's be positive to, to wrap up on hundred green. Cause this is a top. 25 prospects in baseball, probably totally. The reason why we're being more overwhelmingly negative, if Reds fans are like, what, what is this? It's because everybody knows Hunter Green's good. We're not just going to sit here and be like, he throws fast. Like, well, who? <laughs> like, we want to tell you like stuff that, that I think is part of the reason why you're not going to see him on the opening day roster, most likely, which is, is helpful, I think, to understanding the long term outlook. The fastball can be a little bit flat, but here's the thing. His average fastball velo would have been the tops in baseball. I think only behind DeGrom or it would have been right there tied with DeGrom. I, that's absolutely. I think it was right there. That's 99.3 miles per hour. Absolutely insane. And his command is not bad. It's or His control is good. His command is not great. He, he throws yeah. strikes. He misses over the middle. And that's why guys are hunting that fastball over the middle. The last thing I'll say on him is phenomenal athlete. You look at the mechanics check. Good mechanics that keep getting better. This is probably, if you told me who's the closest chance of be, becoming to Jake, the closest thing to Jacob DeGrom, the answer has got to be Hunter Green because yeah. he has the 102, the 103. He has the ability to command it. And I, I'm not saying he's going to be him, but he's the only guy that has that kind of just untapped, ridiculous ceiling because of the athleticism and the natural view of. Right. Aside from Grayson Rodriguez right now, this guy is the highest ceiling in, in baseball when, it, when you look at pitching, right? I mean, in terms of minor league baseball pitchers, Hunter Green is only second to Grayson Rodriguez when you look at what he can do. Uh, and the answer to what he can do is become the most electrifying starter in Major League Baseball. Yep. And I don't think there's a question about that. You're right. Like we're poking holes in somebody we know is good. It's like saying Shohei Otani needs to stop throwing his cutter. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're saying that because that's the only thing he does. That's not phenomenal. Yes. Hunter green. If he turns good control and bad command into good command. I, I mean, this guy is, he's solved. It's and, and again, like that or the change up, I think either, or will will help him get to that next level. If he gets both, then we're talking about one of the best pitchers in baseball. I'm really excited for him again, really emphasize the fact that he has not had that much experience. So, I mean, let's talk about this trio now though that they have because you know how i feel about brandon williamson you know how much i like this dude they go out and they get him i I should say really it was it was the mariners that went out and and got jesse winker but they go get uh in return brandon williamson and jack i mean this is a dude to me i i've been just just praising the hell out of him i love his stuff I love his fastball. Talk about a fastball profile that plays up. He's low to mid, but crazy life on it. He hides the ball well. And I love his assortment of secondaries. Sliders above average. Curveball is plus, bordering plus plus. And then the changeup is average to above average already. And he shows an excellent feel for it. Command continues to improve. Let me read you the numbers from the 6-6 lefty last year. Between high A and double A, bulk of the innings in double A. 98 and a thirds innings, 339 ERA, 3.2 FIP, 1.18 WHIP, 37.4 K percentage, 8.1 walk percentage. Jack, this is a guy that is your third best pitching prospect. Your third. Immediately. Pretty nasty. He'd be one in so many systems. He had 153 punch outs in 98 innings. 153 in 98 innings. When the pitch when I, mix is phenomenal. I mean, you just the K's is crazy 37.4 percent strikeout rate he's striking out legitimately more than a third of the batters he's facing and this isn't low a you know what he's also an exceptional build you got to factor that in too so 
a lot like Lodolo, you've got a very well-built left-handed pitcher that has great pitch mix. And Williamson, while the pitch mix might not be as exciting as Lodolo's, is not far off. The problem here that makes Lodolo better than Williamson at this juncture is the command is not there yet. Yeah. The command, he's got to improve on the command. He's got to start in double A probably and then make the quick jump to triple A. I wouldn't be shocked. You have his ETA at 2023. I think that's right. I think he breaks camp in the rotation with the Reds in 2023. But if he came up in July, I'd say that's a bit premature. Don't do that. Yeah, I think it could be a bit premature, but I wouldn't be surprised. You know, I, I would you be surprised if, if Brandon would tense a little bit, right? I, I don't know if I'd be surprised because, yeah, you're right. You have to sell tickets, but I'd tense up a little bit. I'd be nervous with Williamson because, again, I'm worried really, really good stuff. But where's the command? I'm worried he would nibble and nibble turns into missing with guys that don't have pinpoint command yet. And it's, it's, it's something we see so much with the young pitchers, right? They get up to the big leagues. They don't trust their stuff. I, that's, that's just what naturally happens. We even saw it with Shane Boz in his first outing, like nibbling, nibbling, like, Hey, this guy just needs to realize that he's unhittable and, and right. throw it right at the zone. But it's scary. You see Mike Trout standing in there and you're like, I'm supposed to go right at the strike zone here and put it right over right. the plate. Like, what am I, right. what are you talking about? I've seen highlights well, of this guy hitting 500 foot bombs my whole life. Here's the thing, man. Like that was the glass now problem. You remember glass now when, when he debuted, I mean, he was nibbling and he couldn't throw strikes for shit. And then he gets to Tampa and Kyle Snyder says, just throw it over the gut. Nobody can touch your stuff. And he turns into one of the most powerful arms in baseball. hundred percent. hundred percent. And so here's, here's the Williamson breakdown here. Fastball 688 OPS against slider 559 OPS against curveball 556 OPS against. I mean, this guy gives you a bunch of different looks and then he has the change up, which gets some swings and misses. It's that that's the distant fourth pitch, but it's enough to mix in. Here's the thing is, is I would be worried about the change up not being as far along as some of the other secondaries, but the slider is unhittable to lefties and the curveball is an 11, five type breaker that is slower and effective against righties. So there's not as much pressure on him to go to the changeup and the fastball is so good with the riding action that his changeup can be more average and play up. I'm very excited about Williamson. And I think we think about this rotation in 2023, because I think everybody will be ready to go in 2023 health, health dependent with you would have Luis Castillo, Luis Castillo. Think about this. Tyler Molly. Then you would have, Lodolo, Green, and Williamson. Yeah. That is one of the most exciting young rotations in baseball. And you got Petty a year behind. Yep. Or two or three or four. I have no idea. Yeah, <laughs> That's maybe, what we'll get to. It may be, maybe 15 years, but he is very exciting as well. Um, this is another fun conundrum. As we go to four or five, um, how, do you, how do you rank Matt McClain against Ellie De La Cruz, right? So, Matt McClain, someone I know you know very, pretty well uh, in terms of yeah. seeing him and knowing what kind of ball player he can be. Ellie yeah. De La Cruz is, is a freak show that is someone that you text me and say, you see, you saw a clip on Twitter and like, what do you know about this guy from the backfield on, on the Reds? Like, that's that's kind of the way it is. And I'm going to text you, what did Matt McClain do at UCLA? Can he play all over? Like, that? that's the way this thing works. But here's the right. wonderful part. Neither of us know how to rank these two guys against each other. Like we're always going to peel back the curtain and be like, yeah, like this is where we're at right now. We have Matt McClain at four and Ellie De La Cruz at five. And I'm being a little bit hyperbolic by saying we don't know. We know. And, and it's always safer to go with the higher floor guy. But I guess there's we could both say there's a level of uncertainty where we could flip flop these guys in two months because Ellie De La Cruz is swinging it and high A. We'll start with McLean, and the reason I'll just give the quick outline on both of these guys, and then we'll dive into McLean first, but I just want to give an outline on both these guys so people understand what the conundrum is, if they aren't familiar with maybe both of them or one of them or whatever it may be. McLean, high floor college guy, can play all over, track record of hitting. We saw him in the Cape, could hit in the Cape, was a first round pick out of high school, turned down the money to go play for, the, for his Bruins that he always grew up and loved watching play. Above average runner, not that much power, but I think it'll play up there, uh, you know, in Cincinnati and an unbelievable field to hit and just a pure gamer. I, that's a guy that he's a big leaguer, right? Like you look at him, you say he's a big leaguer. Ellie De La Cruz is, could, could end up never seeing the big leagues, like realistically. Yeah. But he's a yeah. switch hitter with plus plus speed, plus raw power, 
He's like 140 pounds and already putting up 114 mile per hour exit velos. He's out of this world in terms of athleticism. And I, it's, I always say he's everything Jason Dominguez was supposed to be. I really think he's that much of an athletic freak. How do you stack these guys against each other? Because Matt McClain's best case scenario and Ellie De La Cruz's best case scenario aren't even close. But Ellie De La, Cruz, Ellie De La Cruz's low end scenario and Matt McClain's low end scenario also aren't even close. So it's like, what's your what's your risk tolerance here? Let's start with Matt Matt McClain, a guy that I know you you are definitely high on. And Matt McClain is like embodies what you let, look for in prospects, right? Like college guy who does it all, gamer, blue collar, fun player. This is a Jack McMullen guy. Absolutely. What it was Tyler McDonald with the Red Sox, right? He's just utility guy out of NC State. Like you that. sold me on him, by the way. I love him. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like just high floor college bat. The absolute basement for Tyler McDonald is a big league bench bat, bench utility guy, um, which I love. Matt McClain, if everything goes to shit, he is a utility bench bat. Yep. He can play some short. He can play some second. He can play some third. If need be, he can hit 240 off the bench. That is worst case scenario. Best case scenario He's a very, very steady presence in the middle of your order. I see a six hitter here that can play short. I could even see a two hitter. I could see a two hitter, right? He, he's never in a power position. Like he might be 10 to 15 homers at Great American Ballpark, but he could hit 290 with 15 homers and 25 doubles. Like that's who McLean is. I see a two hitter as the ceiling. I see a six hitter as the middle with an everyday glove. And I see a bench utility guy as the floor versus Ellie De La Cruz. I see, you know, like Fernando Tatis as the ceiling. <laughs> yeah. And I see, you know, the guy in double A that, that flares out as the floor. Yes. So which one do you side with? Like, I personally side with McLean because I'm kind of a pansy and I am risk averse. Yes. But I love the idea of Ellie De La Cruz turning into Fernando Tatis Jr. I think the second, and, and I'm the same way, I mean, with, with prospect, the, the, the nature of prospecting is volatile in, in itself. So if you have an opportunity to hedge volatility, you're going to do that, right? So that's why I would, I would lean McLean. But the second Ellie De La Cruz, let's say, hits in high A and has a K rate under 25%, Just I think me up. Boom. That, that's <laughs> enough to hedge. He's still high risk. That hedges a little bit of the risk. And we're like, all right, fuck it. Let's, let's roll the dice here. Like, let's roll the freaking dice here. Like that, that's what's going to happen. And I, you know, I'm hoping that's what happens, but for now, I mean, McLean's going to be a guy that's going to swing it at double a, you know, who my comp is for, for McLean as I think about it more and more though. I think he probably has a little bit more shortstop ability is Joey Wendell. I, I see some Joey Wendell in there where you talk about the doubles spray it all over the field. The difference is I think McLean will hit for a higher average because McLean won't have the left on left issues that Wendell has. But in terms of just play all over the field, because I, I can't emphasize this enough, McLean was on a loaded UCLA team, like loaded. They had Ryan Creed were at shortstop, so he wasn't going to play there. And they also had uh, Garrett Mitchell in center field. So prior to that, he was playing a little bit of third. He was playing a little bit of second. He was playing all over. Then after Mitchell graduated, he played center. Then he played a little bit of shortstop. Like he can play all over the infield and, and his arm profiles anywhere, his feet, he moves well. Uh, obviously, the bat doesn't profile as a third baseman as much. But I love him as a shortstop that can play all over, that can play the outfield. I mean, this guy is, and again, I, I, the other comp I would give is like Chris Taylor with less power, right? Like you're getting that kind of athleticism and fun ability all over the diamond. I, I would almost say if it was like Joey Wendell and Chris Taylor had a kid. It's Matt McClain. I was going to say Luis Arias with slightly less power, but more bat to ball. Yeah. Can play second, short, third. K rate hovering right around 20%, walk rate hovering right around 11%, and gives you slightly above average defense at all three spots. Yep. And, and you know what the, the trend is with all of these guys we just listed as comps? Teams They're all good? Them. Well, yes, that. And their teams love them. <laughs> like, yes. They're more yes. than what, what meets the box score. They are so essential to their ball clubs, and, and each of those ball clubs love their guys. So we'll talk Dilla Cruz really quickly uh, before we move on to number six. Okay, it's like this is a guy, dude, that when I wrote up this red system, I was floored, absolutely floored at what what he could be capable of, what he could be capable of. He also chases a pretty decent amount. Um, he's super raw, but a switch hitter who's 6'2", 150, and already putting up exit velos 
up, upwards of 112 to 114 miles per hour, which is already a well, well, well above average at 150 pounds. Imagine he puts on some muscle. 70 grade runner without a doubt. I mean, I, I corroborated this with, with a couple of people that had I know that had seen him in person because I watched a video of him getting first to third and or home to third in about half a second on multiple triples. And I was like, whoa, okay, this guy's a freak show. Maybe it's the video, maybe it's the angle. I texted, I was like, is this guy a 70 grade runner? Yes, 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 yes. Every reply was yes, maybe more. So his legs are so long, his strides are ridiculous. What I will say though is his swing is not nearly as chaotic as I thought it would be. Like if you put his swing against Dominguez, I would take De La Cruz. It's more quiet, it's more simple. So you have a switch hitter with questionable hit tool, plus plus raw power potential, plus plus speed, and we'll see where he plays defensively, but he has a plus plus arm as well. <laughs> like, how do you not have this guy at least in the back end of a top 100 and say like, let's see what the hell happens here. Yeah. We'll, we'll get to Serda in a moment, but who's got a quieter swing De La Cruz or Serda because Serda has like, he's got a little bit of quick twitch in his swing right now. He's got some herky jerk right now. I would honestly say De La Cruz is, is more quiet for the most part though. At the end of the year, the changes that Serda made, I think, kind of put him ahead. So Serda made those adjustments to his swing at the end of the season. We saw him really improve, and I think that put him ahead, and I'm excited to talk about that. Mm -hmm. So right now, I mean, Serda's much more advanced with the swing, but I think where De La Cruz is at his age development is ahead of where Serda was at that point. You know, because I went back and watched some of Serda's old swings, and I was like, holy chaos. But he tempered that down a lot, and he looks a lot better now. Um, So De La Cruz, Jack, to, to wrap up on him, all I'll say is if he's a top 30 prospect by the end of the year, I wouldn't bat an eye. Yeah. I'm serious. Like that's how crazy he is physically. Another guy that could be in that department, I would probably still bat an eye, but a guy that could be in that department is Chase Petty. And he comes in at number six here. Yeah. Petty, I think is going to be a slower burn. We, we we've talked about this. We talked about it on the just baseball show with the trade Sonny gray. You know, I, I wouldn't be thrilled about trading him. Uh, but instead of getting, you know, like Sonny gray, that trade, like a 30 year old, 31 year old starter, with two years of control, but at like $24 million, that kind of screamed like lottery ticket, lower level prospects, which Chase Petty technically is that. I would not have thought that they would have got Chase Petty in that deal. I, th- I thought they came out very strong given the circumstances. I mean, this guy could end up being one of the top pitching prospects in baseball in a couple of years. He hit 102 on the radar gun in high school. Yeah, I mean, like, listen, the fastball slider already is really good. Bullpen. He can't, he can't throw strikes yet. Yeah. He, he simply can't like there, there's it's high effort. Um, he is a really good athlete. Um, where was he? Del Barton in New Jersey? No, he wasn't a Del Barton guy, but he was nearby. I think they, they squared off against the Del Barton boys. Well, he and lighter are, are boys. They're I friendly. I don't, yeah, I know. I, I know they're friendly. I don't know if he was a Del Barton guy. Volpe and, and, and lighter were the, were the Del Barton guys. Yeah, but I mean, Petty is a high school right-handed arm from the Northeast that was pumping 102. Which is you screams don't see risk. That. It screams risk. It screams risk. It absolutely does. When you see 102 from prep righties, it's Kolick from Texas or Riley Pike Bro, this is like the third this is, Kansas. Time out. This is the third podcast in a row you've mentioned Tyler Kolick. I'm putting my foot down. But whenever you say Chase Petty, my mind goes to Tyler Kolick because I like thinking well, worst well, case scenario. Put Yeah, yeah. Can you pick a worst case scenario that doesn't hurt my feelings? Uh, yeah, Riley Pine. There you go. Much better. Okay. Out of retirement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Out of retirement. Like, Riley like, look, Pine's I, from- I, I stomached the colic thing a couple times now, but like the 12 year old in me is like crying inside. Like, to, please. I understand. I understand. But listen, I mean, like Pine, they're all different builds. Colic was big, burly Texas boy. Yeah, Pint was a lank machine. He looked like Slenderman. And then you got Petty, who just looks like, you know, he's the star quarterback and the star shooting guard and the star pitcher. Yeah, like, He just looks like the really good high school athlete that just happens to pump 102. Um, 102 is great if you have command or control of it. Green has control of it. Petty does not have either yet. Not yet. Not yet. And, you know, I think, I think it's great, though, that Petty is in a system that just saw a dude like this, right? I mean, they saw a young Hunter Green coming up, throwing 102, trying to control it. So I feel like, and I know that they don't have all the same guys there um, development-wise, but they do have a lot of the same guys still. They still have some of the same dudes. 
and they know how, how it worked with Hunter Green. And who knows how it works with their camp. The Hunter Green might end up interacting with Chase Petty and working with him. Who knows? But I, I think with, with the pitching situation they have now, I think the Reds could really be a good team to unlock him. I don't think the Twins have been as good with developing arms as the Reds have. I know the Reds have had some injury concerns and, and Kyle Bodie, they parted ways with for whatever reason. But I would still say, would you have more confidence in the Reds developing Chase Petty or the Twins? Reds. Reds, absolutely. And this is a good, good move. Like not saying move as in it was his choice, but this is a good switch for Chase Petty. I think it improves his long-term outlook. And look, we'll see how he looks this year. We'll see how they decide to roll him out. But when you have a 70-grade fastball and a 70-grade slider, he just needs to develop the change up. I, I can't even say he doesn't have it yet. We, we haven't seen if he has it or not yet. And, and the command, you know, I think it comes with the mechanics. You're more of the pitching mechanics guy. I just see a lot of effort in there, but sometimes that's, that's just implied effort. Like sometimes it's not really that, that much on their arms and it just looks that way. I just see a little bit of effort in this delivery. Yeah, I, I see a delivery that should warrant that warrior cry when you release the baseball, right? Like the the Granky grunt or the yeah. Nadal grunt when you when he's swinging with the forehand. Like that's what I see with Petty, and, and it's concerning because I don't know a the injury concerns there with high effort delivery, yes, but b the the consistency mechanically with high effort deliveries is usually so low. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And, and that's going to be the interesting thing to follow here. Uh, but I am very excited to, to see how they kind of roll them out this coming year. And, and at the end of the day, this is another high upside prospect. Very soon, the Reds could have the most exciting pitching prospects in baseball, I think. Uh, or at least be up there. Up there. It's going to be Mariners. It'll be, you know, Marlins with Meyer and Yuri Perez and, you know, some of their other pieces. But I would, I would probably take these four up there with anybody if Petty looks good next year. So very excited to see him. Uh, moving on to the guy you you had mentioned earlier in Alan Serda. Alan Serda is a guy that you, I, I got to give you credit. This is, this is all you. You know, I, at that point in the season, had not been really able to see Alan Serda. I'll be honest. Also, like in the, at the point of last year when you had seen Alan Serda, I wasn't really keeping tabs on, the, on Red's offensive prospects that much. Like, I, I really wasn't. I was looking at the pitchers, and I didn't have the, the bandwidth to get to Alan Serda. That's where Jack yeah. McMullen comes in. That's where my co-host oh. comes in here and, and says, look at this dude, Alan Serda. I did my dive and I was sold. You know, I, I was definitely sold. And by sold, you know, I'm not saying this guy's Matt McClain guaranteed big leaguer, but man, you can see what could be there. Um, really good year overall. Really excited about the adjustments that he made. I want you to talk about, you know, what you saw from him. Um, and, and we'll get into that. And then I want to get into what I saw in terms of the adjustments between low A and high A. And at the end of the season, those improvements we saw at the plate real quick before I kick it to you overall numbers on the year between low A and high A. And this is another guy that was really impacted by 2020, by the way, had never played above the Dominican summer league and short season or rookie ball uh, in 2019. Yeah. No 2020 season makes the jump uh, to, to low A uh, last year. Really, so his first full professional season, 250, 361, 523 slash line, 17 home runs, 54 extra base hits, 139 WRC plus, 29% K rate, 11% walk rate. You can see the profile there as, as implied risk, but you can also see the implied excitement and potential here uh, for a very thumpy offensive prospect here. 100%. I, I saw a 21-year-old outfielder, he's 22 now, uh, that – you know, when you watch him with the naked eye, when you see the first swing he puts on during an at-bat, right? You know, oh, oh, maybe he chases a fastball outside the zone. You immediately jump to the conclusion, okay, he's certainly not a 250 guy. He's probably hitting 230. He's certainly not a sub 30% K rate guy. He might be near 35. And then he's probably not, uh, like his walk rate is probably 5%, not 11%. But then you watch Serta more and you're like, okay, this is a freaky athletic guy that actually has good command of the strike zone. Um, bat to ball is a little bit better than you would initially prognosticate. Uh, and the batting average is higher than you would think for a 21 year old outfielder. When I say freaky athletic, I mean, freaky athletic. Yeah. He is thin, but oh my God, does the swing play? It's torquey. He carries a lot of momentum on the barrel through the zone. Um, you know, I, I saw him play defensively. He is a rangy 
corner outfielder. He could probably fill some innings in center. I think he has the ability to become a top flight right fielder because of the range and because of the arm Uh, and the bat. The thing is like, we're going to see him put a ball like 440 feet out at great American ballpark. Shouldn't be shocked. We're also going to see him rip doubles into the right center gap. He is a very talented athlete that happens to be a strong, mentally strong hitter at the plate and a really good defender. You know, it's funny. The thing I was going to say too, is we're going to see him like inside out balls that carry over the wall in right field, you know, like the classic right fielder jumps over, tries to rob it, just gets over his glove. And Saradat was like, probably running around first, like, whoa, that got out. And we're all like, whoa, that got out. Like that's the kind of power he has. Uh, It's funny because you you allude to a lot of those things that he has the risk profile, but has a lot of like smaller aspects of his game that hedge some of that risk, which lead me to, to be a little bit more encouraged. His chase rate, not really that egregious. Average chase rate in the minor leagues is around 30 to 35%. Depends what level you look at. 32% K rate for him. So, or chase rate, excuse me, for him. Not bad at all. Uh, you know, the, the bat to ball was a bit inconsistent at times, but as you mentioned, when he was using the whole field, he was much better early in the year in low A. I think it was like, I'm a big power hitter. I need to show him a power hitter. I haven't played in, you know, two years and I haven't really gotten a chance to show anything yet. And he didn't want to get rule five probably either. I mean, this is a guy that just had to get added to the 40 man hand to prove himself this year. And I think there was a little bit of that. Like, let me try to just demolish baseballs in low A. And he demolished them. I think he had 14 jacks down there, but what yeah. we saw him do in high A was really adjust things. I, he made his swing and his pre-swing movements so much more repeatable and smooth. He, he adjusted his setup in the final month of the season. It helped him keep his weight back because that was a big thing for him. You talk about the, the force through the baseball. This is a guy that's 6'3 and wiry strong from, from his feet to, to his shoulders. And now with that adjustment he made in his stance uh, to get more into that back hip, just such easy power off of that backside using his entire body and not being more of just that Yankee arm swinger that we were seeing him try to go pull side as a result, Jack, not only did it help him with his just natural ability to drive to all fields, it helped him stay back. It helped him have more time to hit and it helped him use the whole field more. And look, we're talking about a guy that had never played above rookie ball and Instead of what we almost always see, you see it day in and day out, Jack, when you were in high A last year, guy rakes in low A, gets up to high A and gets blown up. Yeah. He was better. His walk rate stayed the same. His K rate dropped by 8% in yeah. those 87 plate appearances. I don't think that's a coincidence. The power did drop a tad, but it was only because he wasn't looking to go pull side with everything and was using the whole field, hit more doubles, made more contact, and the power is still going to be there anyways. I, I really like the changes that he made. And to me, that really bumped up his prospect value uh, for me. Yeah, I think low A, he was trying to be a 30 homer guy. I think when he got to high A, he, he understood his identity more. And that's a really athletic 20 homer guy. 20 homers, 30 doubles, playing exceptional defense would be phenomenal. Like and, Alan and I think there's is- more. There might be more. There might be more. That's the thing. We got to see this guy fill out. We got to see this guy, you know, fully reach his potential because when he fully reaches his potential, I think you're looking at currently the seventh best prospect in the red system by you, but a guy that has all-star potential if everything goes well, which is crazy to say. And that speaks to the reds, a development and B the depth in the system. Correct. Cause I mean, before the acquisitions, he was five, you know, so he, he was right there. Uh, so, I mean, this is a guy that was knocking on the door, still is knocking on the door. The top 100 was him and Petty are right there. Uh, yeah. But, you know, this is a guy that has major upside. Again, another dude with a good year, a good start to high A, where we think he'll repeat next year or this coming year. Uh, he'll be in that conversation. Coming in at number eight real quick, Graham Ashcraft. This is a guy that I think could be that Swiss Army knife you were talking about, like Hunter Green. Ashcraft, I, I, I talk about this a lot. He has the exact pitch profile on his heater. Uh, as it really is a cutter almost his slider and his fastball is similar to the way class a attacks hitters. That slider is almost like it's, it's a gyro breaking pitch. It's disgusting. He gets a ton of ground balls. He gets a ton of swings and misses and he can run it up really high velo wise. He was phenomenal uh, between, I believe it was high end double a last year, 111 innings, three ERA, yeah. 286 FIP, 111 whip, 28% K rate, 8% walk rate. Jack, this guy is nasty high floor of a 
high leverage reliever, but you can stretch this dude out too. Yeah, so I'm shoving high A in Dayton and then kept tabs on him in Chattanooga because I was so high on him because I saw him hit 99, 100 miles an hour with the fastball. And then later in the summer when he was in Chattanooga and double A, he was shoving again, 99 to 100 miles an hour with the fastball. That's what Ashcraft can do. He's a thick MF too. He's 6'2", 240. I mean, he uses his big body to his advantage with that fastball slider combo where, you know, say he curls the fastball a little bit, it turns into a really solid cutter. He can get away with some mistakes because he is hard and harder. Um, yeah, I, I think he's, he's a big league bullpen arm and a really good big league bullpen arm this year. I like it. I like it. because and, and again, this is a team that can use some help in the bullpen and could maybe use the spot starts here and there. He's perfect. And what, would, what did we talk about earlier, Jack? High ground ball rate, high K rate. I mean, he, re- he recorded a 61% ground ball rate in his 72 innings at Double H Chattanooga. I'm in. <laughs> like, come on, dude. I and again, his fastball is really a cutter, right? Like, what, what did that look? You saw him in person, right? Didn't you? Yeah. What did that thing look like? Because I, I I'm telling you, and this was something I I spent an extra. 45 minutes on Graham Ashcraft, I think, is than everybody else because I was watching his pitches and I was like, what the hell is this fastball? It looks like a sinker, but it's it's like it's just it's a gyro. It was a it's like a gyro fastball. And I looked at the pitch profile. I literally broke out the rap soto charts. I'm looking at the vertical break, the horizontal break. I'm like, where does this line up on the chart? I see where it lines up. I'm like, yep, so that it literally right on the dot gyro. I look up Emmanuel Class A. It's exactly identical. I reach out to our like the head of analytics in Colby Olson. And I'm like, Colby, does this make sense? And he's like, oh my gosh, yeah, that's that's literally class A. Um, that's what Graham Ashcraft can be. Like, that's not, I'm not like, it's not crazy to say that if they don't want to use him as a starter, he can be a lights out closer. I really believe it. I really, really do. Yeah. And in righty righty matchups, he was fine. Uh, but against lefties like this right-handed pitcher was so good because he was sawing off so many left-handed bats. And that's oh. where you see it. Like when you watch with the naked eye, you're like, Oh my God, lefties, this would be impossible because impossible. everything is working in on your hands. He might lead MLB relievers in broken bats when and he comes up. And it dives too. It dive like he he'll he'll have it. He'll manipulate it sometimes for cuts in on your hands, but he'll manipulate it where it cuts straight down too. He'll make it more of like a horizontal cutter. He'll make it more of a gyro cutter. Like he's he's very unique. Swiss Army esque. You mentioned the splits, which I'll wrap up on on him with this. Four forty five OPS, thirty four percent K rate against lefties. Six fifty six OPS, twenty three point four percent K rate against righties. So good enough against righties. I think you would see that get exposed a bit more as if he stretched out five six innings. That's why as a reliever, when it's 99 to 100, potentially righties will, will struggle equally as well. And that's where he can sit in a one inning spurt. He could sit 99. Graham Ashcraft is the one that, you know, he enters for the Reds against three, four and five, where you have two lefties and he sits them down. Mm-hmm. That's what he can be. Because if, if you don't do your homework, when Ashcraft comes into the game, you say, okay, power righty, let's throw a lefty bat in there. Yeah. It was like, dude, you'd be surprised. I remember growing up watching Ichiro and then as I became more of a loser and started to understand splits, yeah. um, watching how naturally. many teams, how many teams naturally, how many teams would go to the lefty against Ichiro. I'm like, D- 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 what? I'm like, do you look at the numbers? He crushed lefties. He was a reverse splits guy. Um, I always thought that was funny. And Ashcraft's a guy that could really kind of mess up the system there. Um, with, with the way teams might approach it. This is where things get chaotic, and we'll kind of go short on some of these, these guys here as we approach the hour mark. Chaotic is the best way I could describe it because I think you could randomly slide each of these guys around. And, and honestly, I think Reese Hines, as, as we look to like maybe make a few adjustments, I might even tweak Reese Hines after seeing some of the things that I've seen recently, um, given his injuries that cut a season short and hurt his momentum, but he comes back and I'm hearing nothing but great things on the backfields uh, from some people I'd reached out with, with the Reds also really liked what I saw physically uh, in, in spring training so far. Right now we have Jay Allen nine, who's the recent, uh, what was it? First round draft pick 30th overall on yeah. 2021. We have Austin Hendrick 10, who was a first round pick in 2020 who couldn't have been much worse. Uh, but again, you know, he, he is so toolsy, bat, unteachable bat speed. You, you can't forget about this kid after one year. 
And yeah. then we have Reese Hines at 11. Hines is the least athletic of the three in terms of just his ability to play anywhere other than maybe corner outfield or third. You know, you're hoping Hendrick can play center or a plus corner. And, and you're hoping Allen can play good defensive center field or plus corner as well. Uh, Hendrick and Allen are like multi-sport athletes. Hines is a little bit more of a clunker. Hines has the most power. How do you rank these guys? Because it, they're all in a little bit of different scenarios. I think Hines had a sneaky good year last year before his injury. Yeah. I mean, 260 with a 542 slugging, like he is a power bat. He's a big guy, 6'4, 220. Again, big guy. Um, I like Heinz's floor over any of the other two. I know nothing about Jay Allen. I know a little bit about Hendricks and I know the most about Heinz. Um, I like Heinz's floor because I think it, at the end of the day, he is, you know, a, a bit of swing and miss, uh, but with a lot of power because of that big frame and his ability to jump on it. Uh, Hendrick, there, there's like one change you're asking him to make. And then after that, he can become like a legitimate top 10 prospect in the system. But if he doesn't make the change, he, he falls out quick. And, and um, it's and a difficult Alan, change. Know, it's a difficult change, too. It is. It is. And, and Alan, I don't really know. So I, I trust your judgment on this. Um, I will say I like Heinz's floor over any of the other yeah. two. So that's, that's kind of what's waiting me. So the, the reason why I have really the only reason that I have Alan ahead of these guys at this juncture is, and is that really, and this is one that literally I could flip around. Like that's, I was like leaving this one. I, I didn't finalize these last three until we really fleshed it out because you could really move it around any way, any which way. There's an important note on Heinz that came out earlier in the month from the Reds farm director, uh, who is uh, Sean Pender. And this was via the Cincinnati Inquirer and Charlie Goldsmith. And great work, Charlie Goldsmith. Charlie Goldsmith, great job over there. And, and I know our friends, uh, our Cincinnati Reds fans, are probably a fan of his. Uh, yeah. We made a decision, and I quote, so this is the quote, we made a decision to get him, and this is in regards to resigns, on the field healthier. He has problems with his legs for whatever reason in the infield. He's an offensive guy first. He's a great athlete. And the more we can get him on the field, he can use his speed, his athleticism, and his power in the outfield. Um, so they're moving him to a corner outfield spot. Hines can move well enough to play there. Uh, I think that's going to be an easier mental thing for him. I mean, the hot corner can be a lot if you're struggling to stay healthy there and just the natural, uh, I think, just demand of the position. He can be the corner outfield masher that he's supposed to be, I think. I think that's really what he always profiled as. Uh and, and the numbers in low A, talk about another guy that was really impacted, Jack. He was drafted in 2019 in the second round. Didn't play in 2019, really, uh, because he was just drafted out of high school. Then 2020, got bagged, just absolutely banged. So this was his first pro season, really. And he was hurt, finally had some momentum, and then ended up getting hurt. But in 43 games, hit 10 jacks in low A, and 28% uh, K rate was the concern. But if he seemed to start to scale that down a little bit as the year went on, and then he got hurt. So... I think Hines is probably the guy that's shown the most positive stuff so far. I think the move to the outfield is going to bode well for him. Um, and that's probably a guy that I'm putting ahead of these other two. The only reason I have Allen ahead of them is that he hasn't showed us any reason to not be there, but Allen could come out and, and you know, just struggle offensively too. three sport athlete. Uh, I was really encouraged by what I saw with Allen swing. I think he's much more advanced bat to ball than I think anybody would have expected from a three sport high school guy. Uh, yeah. But I think it's pretty clear that Hendrick is the third out of this trio. Yeah. I, you, from what you just told me, yes, it, which is crazy because like Austin Hendrick was the guy that, you know, he was, the, he, it was Hendrick and Hassel. Was it not like Veen yes, was, was in that conversation too, but I mean, Veen and Hassel are just so far ahead of Hendrick. I mean, you look at a 38% K rate and a 211 batting average in low A. His, his swing is so broken. Um, you know, the bat speed is crazy, but he, he has so much movement. He, he doesn't repeat his load well. He struggles to get to the same spot every time. It is a big barrel tip. By the time he gets to where he wants to get, the, the fastball is already on him, so the bat speed is almost irrelevant because it takes him so long to even start launching. And, and this is a guy I watch a swing. I go straight to, let me see fastballs 93 and above. Like, I, I can almost tell you without a doubt that – He's not going to be good with fastballs 93 and above, very armsy with the swing, which can cause yeah. him to get a bit, a bit long. Cause he, you know, and he was a Northeast high school guy that was facing 78 to 80 mile per hour pitchers in, in Pennsylvania. 
Um, yeah. He even admitted it himself. It's like the competition wasn't great. So, I mean, he could get RMZ and he could just, just throw his hands at it and crush it. Fastball is 93 and above last year, Jack. He hit 125 against him. Um, you, you, you just can't do that. Um, you, you're not going to be able to survive. So, but here's the thing is he could tone things down. He could put his bat on his shoulder, simple load and throw his hands more simply, right. And, and keep the swing shorter. And he'd still have good power. He'd still have 25 home run power. So that's why I don't want to give up on him is because he can make one adjustment and all of a sudden now he's exploding and he's taken off. And how many times have we seen a guy struggle in his first season? Oh, I'm in adjustment. Now I look great. Um, yeah. So we're not giving up on Hendrick, but he hasn't shown us enough, I think, to be ahead of some of these other guys. And yeah. uh, that's kind of where I line up there. We are pretty much the honorable mention area now, because this is the only system right now that we have 12 write-ups for because the Reds added all of this talent. Yeah. Um, Andrew Abbott is a guy that you think could be, could kind of infiltrate the three that we just mentioned in the prospect ranking left-handed pitcher out of UVA. I love Abbott. I really do. I think he's a high floor Southpaw. I thought that was a great pick at 53rd overall in the 2021 draft. I thought the Reds did a good job in the 2021 draft period. Abbott was phenomenal in at UVA. Uh, you made the case to me that you think he should be higher. I am very open to that idea as well, because I do like his pitch ability and the fastball does have a unique profile to it and does have some sneaky life. I do have concern of what the Vigo is going to look like on that pitch when he's stretched out five, six innings, if that's going to dip more into the 89, 89 to 91 territory or more to the 92 to 94, like we saw him in the two inning spurts in his pro debut. Yeah. I, at the end of the day, regardless, like I think he can get away with 89 to 91. I don't know what baseball is going to look like in two years, where if 89 to 91 is entirely extinct, which is honestly kind of where we're headed right now, but He's got three good pitches with the ability to improve the changeup right now. The fastball, he's got good command of. The slider is already pretty solid. The curveball is good. I love the curve. That. Yeah, the curveball works off the fastball really well. And then the changeup is a work in progress, but room to grow with it. Um, and I do overall like the command. He's a smaller guy, six foot 180, as a left handed pitcher that throws 89 and 91. I don't really like that, but you know, again, small pitchers have traditionally been fine. It does not matter to me. Like, you know, lighter is going to be good. Pedro Martinez was good. Marcus Stroman just signed for $71 million. Like small pitchers can get it done with yeah. Abbott. What I love here is he was able to empty the tank in a reliever role his first couple of years at Virginia. So his freshman year at Virginia, he had a three, one, eight ERA 51 innings across 24 outings. He started just one game. His sophomore year at Virginia, 3.89 ERA, 24 outings, two starts, 44 innings. And then you look at 2020, he made the switch to entirely bullpen. He did not spot start, and this guy was stupid. 28 punch outs and 13 and a third innings. And then COVID happened. 2021, he comes back for his fourth year at UVA, 2.87 ERA as a starter, 106 and two thirds innings, 162 punch outs. The strikeouts were there in college baseball. You worry with a strikeout guy in college baseball, he gets to professional baseball. Hitters are just better than they are in college, and the strikeout numbers dip. When you look at strikeouts per nine, his senior year at Virginia in 2021, 13.7 Ks per nine. And then he starts three games in Daytona, 15 and a half strikeouts per nine. He threw 11 innings. Siri is trying to tell me something on my watch right now. But he threw 11 <laughs> innings, and he struck out 19 guys. It looks like the strikeout stuff is there. And yes, it's low A for a college arm. But with the pitch mix like that, I don't think the strikeout numbers drop like crazy. No, I, I think you lay out a perfect, a perfect, uh, I think just blueprint for him. We've seen guys that make 90 to 91 work. He was one of them was a guest on the Just Baseball Show with Nestor Cortez. If you have the complimenting arsenal and you have the fastball profile and command and, and built in deception, you can make that happen. I think Abbott is capable of that. The 12 6 curveball is a big one for me because if it was, if his best soft off speed was his slider or secondary was his slider, I'd be a little bit concerned because that doesn't play to righties. 12 6 will play to lefties and righties. I think the changeup is still a big X factor. The slider will be a good way to get lefties out. The curveball will, will keep both guys honest from both sides of the plate. The changeup is the big X factor. If he can get that pitch to, to play up and, and get that to be above average, the fastball will play up as well, uh, especially off of that 12 6. He'll have to be 
His margin for error will be smaller than most, but we've seen guys succeed with a smaller margin for error. Uh, and, and I like Abbott as a guy that could also talk about high floor could be a very solid back end of the rotation starter uh, for, for a good team. Uh, worst case scenario, he's a swing man. I think uh, he's got the, cause I, I, his floor to me is like, he's going to climb through the minors quickly. It's just what, how much can he give you? You know, how much yeah. is there in that tank? And that's the question. He's a very rare reverse prospect almost uh, in, in that, in that sense. And you know what? We, we talked about the, the five man rotation in 2023 uh, with Castillo, Mali, Lodolo, Green, Williamson, and Petty on the way. Abbott is the sixth, is a very strong six. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and could be, you know, more than that. You know, so I think that's a really good spot. A few names to, to go over real quick before we do the final segment of the showdown where are you putting your money, Jack, between Lodolo. Yeah green or i'm throwing williamson in the fold too here uh ivan johnson switch hitter with above average pop swung it pretty well in the arizona fall league swings and misses a bit middle infielder i I like him uh in his upside but you know just just the the defensive limitations a bit like he's not doesn't excel at either middle infield spot kind of kept him out but a strong 2022 could get him in there tyler callahan's another guy that's just been incredibly injured uh, since draft, since he was drafted, high floor, great bat to ball skills. If he could just stay healthy, miss 2020 and then Tommy John surgery last year. I don't think he'll be a superstar. Wouldn't write him out. As I mentioned in the write up, uh, Matthew Nelson college guy could not have been more of a breakout guy for Florida state as a catcher. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that was a nice little pickup risky, uh, as a breakout catcher, but definitely has some, some intrigue. Uh, Bryce Bonin, is that a guy that you saw on the Cape, Bryce Bonin? I, I saw Bonin actually in high A. Okay, data darling. What do you got on yes. Bonin? I, I, I like this stuff. He was a Texas Tech guy, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, I like, like Bonin. Beater. What? Kind of like Beater. Yeah. Um, I, I like Bonin because he, he's got the really good fastball. Like he was, you know, 95 with life and, and there were innings where nobody was touching Bryce Bonin's fastball. Yeah. Um, is he a starter? Probably not. But is he a reliever with a good fastball? Probably. Yeah. Michael Ciani. Ciani is one of the best defensive outfielders in minor league baseball. He and Pache. Uh, I know you're very low on Pache. You're probably even lower on Ciani. <laughs> Ciani was a guy that was supposed to be really good. Um, probably won't be really good with the bat but he's a really good athlete and he's a phenomenal defensive outfielder. Lion Richardson. Lion Richardson is 98 with the fastball when he's on, but he was so inconsistent. I saw that guy probably more than any other pitcher in high A this year. Uh, and you just had no idea which Lion Richardson you were going to get. Yep. And, and I think that's why bullpen sounds likely, but he could be another lights out bullpen arm. There's a lot of talented arms, even with the inconsistency in the system. Uh, I hope I'm saying this right. Daniel Velohin. Daniel Velohin. I was thinking Velohin. I have no Velohin. idea. Velohin. He's interesting, actually. He was a $10,000 signee in 2018. Um, but left-handed kidding catcher with a big arm and bat-to-ball skills. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm going to pay attention. Let's, let's see how things go. Uh, name to watch. Uh, anybody I'm missing, Jack? No, Matt Nelson is a thick guy. He's kind of immobile behind the plate. Um, but, again, like, he was one of the – the leaders in college baseball and home runs last year. It was him and Cavadas. So uh, I, I dig Nelson's bat potential. Ivan Johnson is not a shortstop. He's a second baseman. Um, like, I don't think he's got the, the tools to no, play short. No, probably. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, he's kind of exciting. Um, you also mentioned Alejo Lopez in here. I know Clay Snowden loves Alejo Lopez. <laughs> they're like um, homies now. Yeah, they're time. homies. <laughs> so- and I, I think that's about it, man. Yeah, I, I really do. But but there's there's a lot of talent. This system has gotten a lot better. Uh, and in this final segment here, you, you can also stray from from what we're doing uh, with with these main names here. But I, I know people have really liked the the baseball card side of things, too, um, because it kind of forces us to put our money where our mouth is. Right. I know you're not as big of a collector as I am, but the idea of where would you put your money if we were doing it or also you just recommending like where, where you think I should put my money, because it's not your money, but you know what, dude, like you don't want to see me lose money. At least I believe you don't want to see me lose money. So when we talk about what prospects, you know, I should be investing in, typically people like to stay away from starting pitchers. I typically like to stay away from starting pitchers, except I bought Grayson Rodriguez. And you know what, if there's two guys that I would like to buy too, because of the upside, 
it's probably Hunter Green and Nick Lodolo, and probably I might sprinkle in a little Brandon Williamson. Who do you think is the most expensive card at this juncture um, of those three? Green by a wide margin. Correct. So Hunter Green's Bowman Chrome Auto, I'm looking at it on eBay right now. His Bowman Chrome Auto is about 87. It ranges from anywhere from 77 to $90 between the, that range. You can pick up a Nickel Dolo for, and this is ungraded Bowman Chrome Auto, for about 35 to, to 50 bucks. My thing with Hunter Green is Hunter Green could actually, like, it, again, like, I don't think he's going to be Jacob DeGrom, but if you told me pick one pitching prospect that could be DeGrom outside of Grayson Rodriguez, I'm probably picking Hunter Green. Pitchers are inherently risky, and this is – you talk about being a pansy. Um, Yeah, this is kind of like the Dilla Cruz versus – you know, Dilla Cruz versus McLean conundrum. This isn't big, expensive card. That's why pitchers are a little bit cheaper or a lot cheaper, I should say, in in the baseball card realm because you've got to pick basically the best pitcher in baseball for it to really go up in value. Whereas the offensive prospects like Tristan Casas keeps going up, Brandon Davis, all the guys we talk about on the eBay segments in the past. I, I like Lodolo's floor and I like him better as a prospect, but would you rather shell out about 75 bucks for Hunter green and hold on to it and just see what happens or 35 to 45 bucks for Nick Lodolo and yes. see what happens. Yeah, I like the potential return on investment on Green more than Lodolo because Lodolo, like, okay, yeah, he turns into a top flight too. You double your money, right? Yeah. Green, best case scenario, he turns into the most electric pitcher in baseball and you quadruple your money. I love the idea of Hunter Green for the value. Uh, Lodolo, obviously, you know, if we're saying he could be a better pitcher and the floor is much higher, Okay, yeah, and it's half the money, but the ceiling for green and the ceiling in terms of reselling a card is way more than double that of Lodolo. And I think it's just a cooler flex of like, I have Hunter Green. Like, I have the guy that throws 103 that is like just super cool. Uh, Not that Lodolo isn't cool, but uh, I got to throw one more little iron in the fire here, though. How about Brandon Williamson at $10? (laughs) <laughs> well, yeah i mean get ten, both. 10 bucks <laughs> just get both 10 bucks you might as well just get that thrown in there you could get brandon williamson's bowman chrome auto out of 99 this is ungraded it just sold for 50 dollars. buy it now out of 99 like that's a guy that i think is just just criminally underrated out of 50 is bowman chrome out of 50 just went for 76 dollars bowman chrome auto out of 50 i i, I actually might buy brandon williamson while we're recording here uh, yeah, go do any, it. <laughs> any other name, like uh, here's, here's the thing too. Like, would you rather, it, it's almost like you got to look at it like a stock portfolio. So if you went Hunter green over Lodolo, then you got to go like Matt McClain over Ellie Dela Cruz, right? If you're buying another card, like you got to go safe on the position player side. But I mean, Ellie Dela Cruz doesn't have a card yet. The second that dude has a card, I'm canvassing eBay every day. I'm, ca- yeah. like, I'm scooping up and I know that I, it might not work out. But that's one that like could turn into the one where I tell people, oh, I bought Ellie De La Cruz for a hundred bucks back in 2022. Uh, and, and it's like one of those success stories where it's $20,000. Like that, that is something that there's not very many guys like that. I'm very interested to see how the market's going to react to an Ellie De La Cruz, because I feel like you're, you're, you're plugged in on the minor league in the prospect world outside of the red spear. Not a lot of people know about Ellie De La Cruz. No, I, I mean, like if Dominguez is Elvis Presley, uh, Ellie De La Cruz is the perfect is like the person performing in your buddy's basement on a, mm. on a Saturday night. I it's which is hilarious. Yeah, I mean De La Cruz. Like I had not heard of De La Cruz before I saw him on your list, and I did digging. What um, about what about when Alan Serda has a card? Is that someone you're looking to like? You would be looking to pick up theoretically. It's got to be the right value. I think if you're looking at if you're looking at I don't know, maybe a Bowman Chrome Auto, like say Lodolo is what? You said 35 bucks? Yeah, pitchers are inherently cheaper. Yeah, if Serda drops at 30 bucks, go get a card or two, I yeah. think. Yeah, that's like a don't go all in guy. Yeah, but if the value is right, if you feel like that's an investment that you want to make and do your own research, obviously, but I would think about it if it was 30 bucks. I would too. But those are the, those, those high risk guys, 
I, I can't go above the triple digits range. Uh, yeah. I, I'm looking forward to cashing in on my Brennan Davises quite soon because I need money to start wasting on other 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 cards. Uh, Love, I, not, but yeah, looking forward to cashing in on those. But uh, I'm gonna get you. I'm gonna get you scooping up some cards here and there. Once once we get once we make enough money on the podcast that you can pay rent and then also say like, hey, like that's why I can't wait. I can pay rent and then I can say, hey, I can actually spend on some stuff too. Uh, that when I can justify. I talked about baseball and now I'm going to buy more cards so I can talk about it and to try to almost talk myself into it being a business expense. That's what yeah. I'm going to get you in on this too. Perfect. I, I'm here for it. So if I were to rank things of priority to spend money on for at this point in my life as a newly minted 24 year old, I'd say rent, groceries, um, keeping my girlfriend on my good side, and then baseball cards. That's so as long as we cover the first three, then we'll go, we'll go with the fourth. That's a sweet spot for baseball cards. That's a good spot. Yeah. Cause you get like, I, these are our partners at eBay. I, I love eBay. I cannot search on eBay. They've done a lot of good things up there. I cannot search, keep my girlfriend happy. And there's, I can't check out and buy something that keep, I guess you could, you could you buy could. like eerie. Yeah. I guess you could. I take that back, but we, we, we that's not what this podcast is for. We're not going to give you jewelry advice. Uh, I, Cause I don't know what to buy on there. So it's not jewelry advice. It's not jewelry advice. Well, well, and I don't think your girlfriend's very interested in any uh, Alan Serda cards, unfortunately. You she just, might be. I got to sell her. I got to show her some Ali De La Cruz video and she might be in. She'll see the, she'll see those strides. She'll see, she'll be like, oh, he's projectable. He's projectable. Yeah. But yeah. I, I hope we sold you guys on Ali De La Cruz and some of these other players. Uh, if, if you ever have any questions on the hobby as well, I, I've, I've really enjoyed a lot of the DMs that come in. You know, I was always a vintage collector. Now getting into the modern side, uh, I've learned a lot about it too, especially being at these card shows. Jack asked me, Jack and Peter asked me a bunch of questions as well about it. So I always enjoy that. A lot of dynasty fantasy questions have come into my DMs as well. I really enjoy that. But also Jack, uh, I don't know. Jack might get mad at me for sending people his way. I doubt it. He likes engaging with the audience. Send Jack any prospect questions because- this man, we announced on the Just Baseball show, he will be calling AAA in Pittsburgh or in Pittsburgh for Pittsburgh in Indy this year. Yep. Congratulations to Jack calling games out there. He will be seeing a ton of players, a ton of prospects. He will also be busy, but I, I know that he enjoys engaging. And uh, if you ever have any questions on the prospect side, Jack is more than able to uh, answer some of those as well. And, and uh, he's going to see it firsthand in AAA. Much deserved gig. And uh, you should tune in if you're a, if a prospect junkie like we are, as I assume you are, you're listening to this podcast for an hour. Jack is great on the call. If, if you guys are picking up what I'm picking up right now, Aram is trying to deflect questions to me. He's trying to lighten his workload. So I am totally okay taking a little bit of uh, Aram's workload. <laughs> No, you know, it just didn't feel right. Like, oh, you can DM me, but that that other guy that I share this podcast. Yeah, he's a zero. Out, His opinion he, means nothing. Don't don't DM him. Um, he, he, what's gonna happen is he's gonna ask me, and then I'm gonna answer on no, no, like Jack is qualified. <laughs> Even more so, I'm gonna be asking Jack questions because this guy's gonna be in the trenches uh in triple A. Deep which, in a man, gonna be talking to these guys. Really, really, really excited for you, man. Um, and uh, this is the last time I'll I'll put you on the spot and talk about the gig in terms of like congratulations. But I think people on this podcast that listen to this podcast can really appreciate how how hard it is from a player's perspective, from a broadcaster's perspective, to climb your way up to AAA. You missed a very important development year in 2020, and you are still I did. up. I did. You missed an important development year, and you have expedited your ETA. You're up in AAA already with only what really one and a half full professional seasons under your belt. Uh, mm -hmm. You're, you're a, a high floor prospect with a high ceiling uh, and uh, very excited to tune into some games this year, brother. Now, nah, man, you just mentioned of the just baseball show. I'm a quadruple a guy. I said, I'm the <laughs> Michael Her I'm the Michael Hermosillo of, uh, of sports broadcasting. So well, I, I said, we're going to find out. Now. We're going to find out if you're a quadruple a guy. But we'll see. I, I don't think you are. I don't think you we'll are. See. I think you've got the upside in the floor, but that'll do it for today's episode. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, we are doing the final touches on the top 100, running it through now a couple big league team execs, uh, everybody else that I can run it by. Very excited to get that out very soon and for everybody to yell at me. So until then, uh, prospect interview finally this week. I think you'll enjoy that one. Jack, any final words on the Reds? Uh, good system. Got a lot better 
they are a top 10 system in baseball. I do believe that because they've got some guys that were higher on than most, a la De La Cruz, a la Alan Cerda. Um, they've got a very high floor bat in McLean as their first position player, and they've got three of the best pitching prospects in baseball. They've got three top 60 arms. Yeah, and high ceiling guys, high variance, high ceiling guys in the back end like Hendrick Hines, uh, you know, and Jay Allen. So a and good Petty. Balance. And Petty, and Petty. So a very exciting system here. Hang in there, Reds fans. Uh, Bob Castellini may be a bit of a broke boy, but I, we'll see. We'll see. But at least these guys could be bright in the future. Thank you, as always. We'll talk to you on Wednesday.